Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. Bright, white, and cold. A typical winter morning in the Berkshires on the 29th of December, 1910. The snow crunched under the men's feet as they made their way from all around Pittsfield to gather down at Moorwood Lake. As the men arrived, they greeted each other, all bundled and wrapped in layers against the chill. They made small talk and stomped their feet while they waited for everyone to get there. A day of work harvesting ice lay before them. Moorwood Lake was owned by the Pittsfield Country Club after having been bought from Sarah Moorwood in 1899. The Country Club let the ice company harvest there seasonally. Before modern refrigeration, harvesting ice was a necessary task to aid in preserving food during the warmer months. When the ice of a clean lake or pond had reached the thickness of about a foot, the ice would be cut into large blocks, which would then be loaded upon a horse cart and brought to an ice house. The history of ice houses is a very long one. The first mention of one in writing was in 1780 BC. They were often built into a hillside, the idea that the constant temperature of the ground would aid in the longevity of the ice. Sometimes, however, they were simply freestanding buildings, as is the case with the still surviving ice house at Hancock Shaker Village. In an ice house, the blocks would be stacked and stored often on a bed of straw. These blocks of ice packed tightly together could last until the next winter when the supply could be renewed. If enough was harvested and had a means of quick shipment, ice could be sent to faraway places that didn't experience winter weather and so otherwise would have no access to ice. And that's the sort of business these icemen worked for. The year before, the Moorwood Lake Ice Company had been bought out by two men with dreams of making it big by supplying ice to whomever was willing to pay, and the prospects looked good. With a recorded 20,000 tons of ice coming from the company each year, its new owners, Everett Leisure and George Shand, thought that they could even do better, 5,000 tons better. And on this morning, the first of the season, on the 29th of December, 1910, men who'd signed up for the work were there and ready to go. Once they gathered the tools at about 9.20 a.m., many of the men began to head down the hillside to the lake from where they'd been waiting beside the boiler house, which stood on the northern shore of the lake. Others still lingered inside the building, warming themselves after the chilly walk to work. The boiler was used to run a machine that brought the blocks of ice up the hill on a conveyor belt. It was only about 10 minutes later that that same boiler erupted in a massive explosion. The building was instantly shredded and its remnants hurled upward into the sky. The sound itself was so intense that windows rattled a mile around the epicenter and the explosion was heard far beyond. The icemen who'd walked to the lake turned around with a start and just in time to see objects begin to rain down upon them. They were forced to dodge the projectiles best they could. Large chunks of the boiler, of the engine it ran, wood debris, and human remains fell from above. Two large pieces of the boiler escaped the scene altogether. One landed 500 feet away and weighed 200 pounds. A second landed 1,000 feet away after snapping five trees in half and weighed 300 pounds. A body was even found to have landed 200 feet away. The men who were able to avoid being injured by the flying objects began to scramble across the ice and snow toward their injured friends. The white of winter lay now marred by flashes of brilliant red. 
Some survivors lay squirming in pain, some motionless in shock, some still in death, and others mere fragments. A dozen men were dead in an instant, done in a horrible, brilliant flash. Only two of those killed instantly were found outside the building. Numerous more lingered in agony, and as the ringing in their ears subsided, it was replaced by the cries of others. The nearest telephone, as they were still relatively new, was a quarter of a mile away. A man had to run, no doubt powered by adrenaline, that distance to call for help. But the blast had been so loud that it didn't take long for people who lived nearby to also come running to see what happened. And it seemed that in no time at all, there were sleighs there to take the injured to the House of Mercy Hospital. The first came from the fire department, and another soon arrived from the police station. The wounded filled five wagons. After those who were still alive were carried away by those with the knowledge to help, other carts and sleighs began to arrive, those intent on collecting the remnants of the dead. The dead filled three wagons. People searched, trod the snow, back and forth, collecting together the pieces of the dead large and small. Witnesses, who'd only moments before left the building, could remember where everyone inside had been standing. It was eventually figured out that the men standing along the wall at the side of the boiler were killed instantly by the blast, but that those standing at its front were torn to pieces. Before the scene could be cleared, however, people had arrived, lots of them. Word spread quickly, in the small city where everyone knew everyone. And with so many employees, about 150, it seemed that everyone knew someone who worked as an iceman on Moorwood Lake. So people had come running to see if their friends and family were all right. What they saw came as a horrible surprise, many expressing that they simply couldn't look anymore when they realized what it was they were witnessing. In the end, 20 people had been injured, but lived, and the death toll rose to 17. It took some time to identify them all, as some were immigrants and not yet well known in the area. The list of those killed goes as follows. William Dunn, engineer. He was 61 but it is in some places misreported as 35 years old. This mistake may have been made because his son was also named William. Born in 1849 in Ireland, his father was named John, and he lived in Lenox, then Washington, then Pittsfield. He had six children with his wife, Mary Scully. My own great-grandmother, Alice Scully, was Mary's sister. It was his son, who also worked for the ice company, that was there that day, and identified his father's remains. He also remembered his dad telling him that the boiler had been giving him trouble, and quoted him as saying that he would give it a good deal if the day's work was over his head. Edgar Allen, an employee, 28 years old, married to Mary Cochran only four years before his death. They had one child together. John Raymond, carpenter, born in Croton on Hudson, New York. He was 42. He was 42 and had five kids with Janet Chalmer. Leo Leopold Fernandez. He came from Spain and was 28 years old. He'd only just arrived in the U.S. after taking a ship from Spain to Cuba and then Cuba to New York City, where he arrived on May the 5th of 1909. Joseph Gallego. He lived at 177 Columbus Avenue. He was 48 and was also from Spain. Oblino Gallego. He lived at 59 Dewey Ave. He too was from Spain. Fortino, sometimes misreported as Aurelio Gomez. He was 21. He lived at 45 Eagle Square and made it to the hospital before passing away. He was also from Spain. 
All of these Spanish immigrants were also cousins to each other. Martin Smith, when not harvesting ice, he worked as a chimney builder. He was 44 and was born in Kinderhook, New York. He too made it to the House of Mercy before dying. Wyatt Moore, he was 29. He married Margaret Knight and had four kids. George Ward was a fireman. He was 32 and was born in Rensselaer County, New York and married to a woman named Mary. Arthur Papoon, misreported as William. He was only 24. He was married to a woman named Margaret McNamara and they had three children. Elmer Eldridge was a laborer and painter when not harvesting ice. He was 44 and lived at 48 Francis Avenue with his wife. George Alfred Albert Bentz was 23. He lived on West Street. His father was John and his mother, Annie Smith. Alfred Frederick, who went by Freddie Bocar, he died the next day and was only 20 years old, one of seven children. George Hoddling was 37. He and Harriet Stewart had gotten married only four months before his death. James Manellis, misreported as McNally, from Port Ewan, New York, he was the youngest of all to die at only 18. Alfred, called Fred, and so mislabeled in the newspapers as Frederick Berthier, was 25 and had moved to Pittsfield from Canada with his parents when he was a baby. He had worked for a while as a wool boy at one of the local textile mills. Senator Winthrop Crane, a local, the mayor, William McGuinness, and the soon-to-be mayor, mayor-elect, Kelton Miller, whipped together a meeting that very afternoon to discuss how to help the families affected pay for funerals. Within two days, $7,000 had been raised, which in the year 2020 is equivalent to about $185,000. The entire town was in shock. Why and how did this happen? Most of all, who was to blame? Thousands of broken hearts needed answers. The mayor-elect, Keaton B. Miller, said of the disaster, the boiler explosion at Moorwood Lake four days ago, causing the death of 17 men and injuring many others, marked the most horrifying catastrophe in the history of this region. I deem it fitting to put on record here an enduring testimonial to the spirit of our people for the substantial aid and genuine sympathy given to the families of the unfortunate ones. An official investigation was swiftly arranged. While sifting through the scattered remains of the boiler house, the boiler's pressure valve was recovered. As the investigators questioned survivors, they began to piece together the story. The boiler had been acting up previously, the problem being a faulty pressure valve. The danger of not knowing the correct pressure within the boiler is that the pressure may rise too high, resulting in an explosion. Everyone charged with maintaining a boiler knew how immensely dangerous they could be. They'd been exploding since they were first put into everyday use, the earliest taking place in 1705, when a buildup of steam and a pressure valve too flimsy to properly register it caused an explosion at a pond called Broad Waters near Wensbury in Staffordshire. And by the time steam engines were fitted to locomotives and ships, Malfunctions resulting in explosions were not uncommon. The pressure valve on the boiler at Moorwood Lake hadn't been displaying the proper reading. This meant that the operator didn't know to reduce the temperature or release excess pressure. It came to light that both William Dunn, the engineer, and George Ward, a machinist, had expressed displeasure the day before. They worried that the valve had just been replaced, but that the new one wasn't working correctly either. There were claims that one of the owners of the company, Mr. Everett Leisure, told William to close the valve by tightening the compression screw. The screw being tightened became one of the things listed on the final findings of the inquest. That and the gauge malfunctioning and the possible rust causing clogs. But Everett Leisure wasn't found to be at any fault. This didn't save the company, however. Rumors and resentment made the lives of the two owners terribly difficult. By the next winter, 
Beta sold the company altogether. Now known as the Melville Ice Company, they relocated to Goodrich Pond instead. But with time, the world would change. 1910 was just at the edge of great innovations, which made it possible to keep things cold without ice. Refrigeration killed the ice business. And with time, as so often happens, people forgot. Myself, myself, despite being a relative of one killed in this incident, never knew of the event. And until researching the backgrounds of those killed in the blast, did not know my connection to it. Moorwood Lake is now just a placid, beautiful place where people swim and fish. The memory of what happened, long forgotten. There's no monument at this lake, though I'm sure a metal detector might find a little debris from the incident. A person picking up such a fragment probably wouldn't know what it was from. Just another scrap. There's no remembrance to them, but we can remember them here. For it's with time and work and research and diving into history that we find our family's pasts and all of our connections to it. This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can find more episodes by visiting www.theberkshiresgoneby.com by finding us on Facebook and Twitter. You can also find images pertaining to Berkshire history on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as images pertaining to each individual episode at our website. We hope you'll join us for our next episode, and thanks for listening.